What's going on, everybody? Would you guys stay with us? Light is born in a moment As your voice is heard Mercy wakes with the sunrise Glory fills the earth Here we stand before you Yours in victory Throughout endless ages We are free And we will worship and wonder The one who is able To do more than we have dreamed Forever and ever Glory to Jesus Let all creation sing To our King of Kings God from everlasting God before all things And to life eternal Jesus Christ you reign Heaven rings with the music In your presence now As a million voices Join the sound And we will worship and wonder The one who is able To do more than we have dreamed Forever and ever Glory to Jesus Let all Say, and we will worship and wonder the one who is able to do more than we have dreamed forever and ever. Glory to Jesus, let all creation sing to our King of Kings. To our King of Kings. Forever in your name, the 
name of Jesus. You guys can grab a seat. Welcome to Element Church. My name is Andy Hazlett. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Element. And whether you're joining us here in person or via a video screen, we're thrilled that you are here today. If you are new here, then I especially want to welcome you. At the end of the service today, which you can expect to last right about 60 minutes long, we would love it if you would join us over in a place that we have specifically designed for you as our guest. It's called the Living Room. The living room is right through these doors over here. It's across the lobby. And after the service, there will be some volunteers over there that would love to meet you quickly, answer your questions, give you some information about the church. And we have a free gift that we would love to give you as well. It's just our way of saying welcome to Element Church. And we're grateful to have you here today. Well, everything that we are able to accomplish as a church happens in part because of your great generosity as a church. If you're new today, please don't feel obligated to give. But if you're interested in giving, you can give today digitally by downloading the PushPay app and following the instructions on your mobile device. You can also give in person through cash or check by utilizing one of the giving boxes located throughout the facility. But regardless of how you decide to give, thank you for being such a generous church. And I have something really cool I want to share with you. We have a short recap video of the special needs dance that we were able to host just a couple weeks ago here at Element. So go ahead and check out this video.
Let's celebrate that. Isn't that awesome? And that's awesome. And uh, that would not be possible without your generosity. So thank you for being such a generous church. And thank you also to the 139 volunteers that made that event possible as well. Just an awesome thing, an awesome way for us to serve our community. I have just one announcement for you today. In two weeks on Sunday, June 16th, it is Father's Day, but we're also doing uh, baby dedications that day as well. In baby, uh, baby dedications are for children ages three and under. And baby dedications are a great way for uh, you as a parent to make the commitment in front of the church that you're going to raise your child to love and serve Jesus. If you're interested in that, uh, you can register at the computers in the lobby at the Next Steps wall or uh, on the church website. There's more information in the brochure that you can find in the eKids lobby. And also part of the registration process is uh, you'll come into the church, you'll meet with one of our staff members just to help you uh, through this process of making this commitment to raise your child in a godly home. So if that's you, uh, make sure you stop by and get registered for that. Well, today we have a great privilege to receive communion together as a church. And in communion, we are remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. The cup of juice reminds us that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. The piece of bread reminds us that Jesus offered his body so that by believing in him, I can have an unhindered relationship with God. You don't have to be a member of Element Church to receive communion. We just ask that you be in a right relationship with God. And so during this next song, as the band plays, the ushers will come forward and they'll pass down uh, each row, a tray with the elements of communion on it. And if you are participating in communion, you can grab a cup of juice and a piece of bread. And whenever you're ready, whenever your heart is ready between you and God, you can drink the cup of juice and eat the piece of bread, remembering what Christ has done for you.
by your mercy and love. There's not, there's not descriptors to put to it. There's not words we can even say other than there's no one higher than you. There's no one higher than you, God. There's no one higher. There is no one greater. There is no one more powerful. You alone are God. And you allow us into your presence. That blows me away, God. You actually delight to, to give us your presence. And Lord, we thank you that you are in this place right now. You are here. And Lord, we ask for your presence to continue as we look into your word. Lord, regardless of, of what we carried in today, I pray we would leave with you. Leave different. Because we've been in the presence of the God of heaven and earth. Well, thank you for being our God. We give you all praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, you can be seated. Well, have you ever uh, misunderstood how to use something and it caused you to misuse that thing in your life. This happened a couple of weeks ago to me uh, at the gym that I work out at. I, I, in, my, in my normal workout routine, I, I typically lift weights one day a week. I know it looks like I lift way more than that, but it's only one day a week. As, as Pastor Brendan said about himself last week, I'm scary strong, and I know that's what you were thinking about as well. So on the day, on the, on the weeks that I normally do chest and back exercises, there is this machine at the gym that I've wanted to try, but it was always, you know, taken by somebody else. I never could. Uh, the, the machine is a sit-down fly machine. So instead of a, of a weight bench where you lay down horizontally with, with free weights, you, you sit down. There's like the machine here, and there's little weight pins in the back. You select your weight. You, you, you sit down, and there's two arms that come down, and you do flies this way. Sit down fly machine. So the other day, a couple weeks ago, the, the machine came available. I saw it. So I was like, oh, okay, now's my chance. So I go walking over there like I own the place. Uh, I, I select a weight that I thought was appropriate for my very first time ever using the sit-down fly machine. I sit down in the machine, and I'm like, there's only one problem. I noticed the arms were in the back, like right back here, completely behind me. I'm like, how in the world do guys grab a hold of these stupid bars? So I'm like doing this. Try, I'm not going to dislocate my shoulders or something. I was like, there's no way you can grab those bars. So I do this. I was like, maybe this is how you do it. I grabbed one bar, pulled it up, grabbed the other bar and pulled it up. And now I'm ready to go. So I do 10 reps like this. The only problem was after the end of 10 reps, I got to put it back where it was. So now I'm like, <laughs> I thought my muscles were going to rip apart. Like, finally I just let it go. It was like, Bam, the weights clang down. I'm like, man, I hope nobody saw that. Maybe you gotta practice, I don't know. So I rested for a bit, thought we'll try it one more time. So I, I reach back there, I grab a bar again, I pull it up, I reach back, grab a bar again, pull it up, do, do 10 reps, and same thing, like how in the world? Bam, the weights clang down. So I'm in my mind thinking, I've never seen this happen to anybody else. Like, I gotta be missing something. So I, I stand up like I know what I'm doing, like I'm stretching like this, like, whew, yeah, whew. I'm looking at the machine, 
And that's where I noticed the machine has two different settings. One setting is for the sit down flies. The problem was I was using the other setting, which was you can sit on the machine this way, grab the bars here, and do a back exercise like this. Then there's two little pins that release. You can slide the arms forward, lock them in place, sit down, and now the arms are right here for the sit down fly machine. I could not have looked like more of an idiot in that moment than I normally do, right? I was using the sit down forwards fly machine in the backwards locked position. I actually took some time to post this on my Instagram story. Like when you're two sets into a three set routine and realize you were using a new weight machine for the first time incorrectly, I hope no one saw me. That's what I was thinking in that moment because I misunderstood how the machine worked. I actually misused what it was for at least at the very beginning. Now I got it down, right? I, I kind of feel that very same way, misunderstanding, about the word glory in the Christian faith. I'm not sure we fully understand what the word glory means, how we should use it, what that word does in us. And that's why we're starting a brand new sermon series today called Glory that will take us all the way through to September 8th. It's going to span the entire summer in three different Parts. Before I give you a little bit of an introduction on the series, though, I do want to introduce myself to those of you who are new here today. My name is Jeff Manis. I am the lead pastor here. And if you uh, saw me at the gym that day and were wondering, is that the same moron? Yep, you got it. That is me. So glad that you are here today. Uh, whether you're in the auditorium or joining us on video somewhere, thanks so much for choosing to be with us. In this series, we're going to take the last five chapters of the book of Romans in the Bible, chapters 12 through 16, and we're preaching through them verse by verse through the end of the summer. We're going to talk about how the glory of God changes us, that's part one, it unites us, that's part two, and it gives us purpose, that is part three. Now, I believe all five chapters and every section of every chapter hinges on one single verse. It's the theme verse for the entire series. It's the last verse of Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 36 says this. For everything comes from him, that's God, and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. Everyone say glory. Glory. All glory to him forever, amen. Now, the word glory in Romans eleven thirty six, 36, when it was originally written in the Greek language, comes from the Greek word doxa. That word doxa means honor, renown, glory, a divine quality, the unspoken manifestation of God, it means splendor. So we actually sang a portion of a song earlier called The Doxology. You might be familiar with that song if you uh, grew up in church or came from a more uh, traditional church background. The doxology has its root in that word doxa. So the doxology actually means praise or glory to God. So glory is honor renown, splendor, the unspoken manifestation of God. But then this is what stood out to me as I was digging down on this word glory in preparation for this series. The Greek word doxa corresponds with the Hebrew word from the Old Testament, kavod. It sounds like you're hacking a loogie. Kavod, right? Somebody should say excuse you or bless you when you do that. that kavod means this, to be heavy. It can also mean weight or something that is heavy in weight, but only in a good sense. So this is awesome. Glory, as we're talking about, is literally the weight of who God is. It's the weight of who God actually is. That's glory. That the idea of God in all of his majesty and wonder and power and splendor and any other descriptive word you want to put on him, it's heavy. There is a weight to that. There is a weight in a good sense of who God is. 
It leads right into the big idea we have for today. It's actually a springboard for the, for the whole series. It's on the screens if you want to write it down. It's this. Until we acknowledge the weight of who God is, we will never understand the way to bring him glory. Until we acknowledge the weight, the heaviness of who God is, we won't understand the way to bring him glory. It changes everything. Now, I know that not everyone who's here today or watching or listening online believes in God. And so the idea of bringing glory to God is like the furthest thing from, from your mind. And, and while we will love you, we'll welcome you here, whether you ever believe what we believe or not, I actually think today, you couldn't have picked a better Sunday to come than today, because at the very least, you are going to see today not, not proof that there, I can't prove God. You won't see proof that there is a God but you're gonna see a picture of the God that we do believe in as followers of Jesus and why we believe he deserves our glory. Until we acknowledge the weight of who God is, we'll never understand the way to bring him glory. So that leads to this, I think, logical big question. What should we acknowledge about God? If acknowledging the weight leads to the way to bring him glory, what should we acknowledge then about God? And we're gonna see a couple of things here in Romans 11, 33 through 36. And then starting next Sunday, we'll be in chapters 12 through 16 for the rest of the way. Romans is in the New Testament portion of the Bible. It was written by a man named Paul. We call him the Apostle Paul. This book, Romans, was a letter written to a group of Christians in Rome uh, just a couple decades after Christ was resurrected and ascended into heaven. If you don't uh, have a Bible with you, Everything we read will be on the screens today. If you don't own a Bible, you can get one for free. We would love for you to have your own Bible so you can read about the glory of God on your own. And so we give them away. So you can ask for one at guest services or the next steps, we'll, we'll get you a Bible. Romans 11, 33, and then part of verse 34 says this. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? That expression, how great are God's riches, that, that word great implies that God has inexhaustible riches. But not just riches, like, like resources that, that we think of, money, property, assets. He has that as well, by the way. The Bible on many occasions says that all of heaven and the earth and everything in it, all of it belongs to God. So he has inexhaustible resources that way too. But, the, but here in Romans, the word riches is actually tied to wisdom and knowledge. That God's wisdom and knowledge are inexhaustible. You can never reach the end of them. So it actually could read in a more uh, simple way, oh, how great are God's riches of wisdom and knowledge. They are inexhaustible. You can never reach the end. So until we acknowledge the weight of who God is, we'll never understand the way to bring him glory. What should we acknowledge about God? Number one thing I see is this. His wisdom has no limits. His wisdom or his knowledge has no limits. Remember, remember back when you were a kid and it seemed like your dad or your grandpa or whatever that male uh, role model was for you, like they knew the answer to everything. That's what it seems like when you're a kid, right? Like you're driving down the road and you ask your dad about how that building was made or something about nature or sports or a car. It seemed like no matter where you went, like your dad, your grandpa, whatever, they knew everything until you were a teenager and then you knew everything. Can I get a witness up in here from parents of teens in the room? We'll all, we'll all commiserate together. When you were a kid, it seemed like your dad, your grandpa, like they knew everything except anything about women. But I digress. They knew everything, right? They knew, they knew everything. With God, though, it's not like it seems like he knows everything. He knows everything. His wisdom has no limits. His knowledge is inexhaustible. You can't even reach the end of it. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God says this through Isaiah about himself. 
My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. They are inexhaustible. Can't reach them. But it's not just the fact that his wisdom has no limits, like it will never run out, like it's, it's inexhaustible. That, that's true. But it's also a layer deeper that his wisdom has no limits, meaning there is nothing God's wisdom can't do. It is all powerful. There's an old song we learned growing up in Sunday school. You might know it. If you do, you can help me out. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Yes, I had one clap. In this service, there's two claps at the end of it. That's awesome. I don't know if anyone in the video service clapped, but there's one poor soul in this room who is with me. (laughs) Somebody's thinking, I was told this place was weird, and now we just proved it. (laughs) But God's wisdom is all-powerful. Here's what I mean. Proverbs 3, 19 and 20. By wisdom, the Lord founded the earth. By understanding, he created the heavens. By his knowledge, the deep fountains of the earth burst forth, and the dew settles beneath the night sky. So, it was the wisdom of God that created the heavens and the earth. Hello. No wonder we are told in Proverbs that wisdom's more valuable than silver and gold. Nothing you desire can compare with wisdom. We are told to get wisdom, though it costs all you have, get understanding, it says. So when we acknowledge that the wisdom of God knows no limits, it will never be exhausted. Nothing can, there, there's nothing God's wisdom cannot do. When we acknowledge that weighty part about God, we will begin to understand why and the way to bring him glory. And how do we do that? By seeking his wisdom and committing ourselves to live in it. That's the way we bring God glory, based on his inexhaustible riches of wisdom. Did you know that you can just ask for wisdom and God said he'd give it to you? James 1 verse 5, if you need wisdom, beg and beg and beg and maybe I'll give you a little crumb. No, if you need wisdom, what? Ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Anyone need wisdom today? All the parents are like, please, dear Lord Jesus, give me wisdom so I do not murder my own children. (laughs) Right? But we shouldn't just ask for wisdom. We should also align ourselves to the wisdom of God by reading and applying God's word. Let me tell you this, gang. I'm pretty sure you are not going to gain much wisdom from God apart from being in his word. You're not gonna gain wisdom unless you are in his word. That that God's wisdom, not, not all of it, not every single detail of his inexhaustible wisdom, but God's wisdom, what we need to make it through each day is found in the word of God. Yet we have so many Christians in church today who are desperate for God's wisdom but not diligent to read his word. And we wonder why we're lacking wisdom. Like literally, the book of Proverbs is called the book of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 1 through 3. There are, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives to help them do what is right and just and fair. So maybe there's, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, enough for every day of the month, even the months with 31 days. So maybe you could just start by reading the proverb of the day. Today's June 2nd, read Proverbs 2. Tomorrow, read Proverbs 3. Every day, you'll read a, a portion of the book of wisdom in 
the Bible. You, 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 can, you can do the YouVersion Bible app, totally free on any device. There are literally hundreds of Bible reading plans on the YouVersion Bible app. My wife and I this year, we are doing together the chronological Bible through the year. So by the end of the year, we'll have read the Bible chronologically uh, together through the end of the year. We have free devotionals for you. Pastor Andy, uh, he has written a devotional on every single book of the Bible. It's called My Bible Journey. We have some of them printed for free. There's also a website, mybiblejourney.org, All the devotionals are on there as well. It's one chapter of the Bible you read and then some devotional thoughts. We do have the book of Romans available out at the Next Steps wall. Uh, So you can read through uh, Romans from my Bible journey. We have the 21-day devotional we wrote, 21 days through the 21 chapters of the Gospel of John. I've been told it takes 21 days to make a habit. So if you picked up the 21 devotional, read a chapter a day, did the devotional reading, did the questions and prayers, after 21 days, you have a new habit of reading God's word every single day. We sold out of the Romans journals that we had available for sale. We have, we'll have some more in next week. But Romans, the, chap, the book that we're in, is 16 chapters long. If you read one chapter a day, you'd be done in 16 days. If you read one chapter a week, you would actually get done the week after this sermon series ends, the third week of September. Maybe at the very least, we'll try to remind you every single week what next week's main scripture is. Next week is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Two verses. Could you read two verses this week? Just two. Romans 12, 1 and 2, and you'll come next week prepared for what we're going to be talking about. All I'm saying is God's wisdom is contained in his word, but so many Christians never break open the word to receive the wisdom. His wisdom has no limits. And he says, I'm I'm willing to give it to you. You can ask for it and I'll give it, but you can also seek it in the scripture and you'll find it. Until we acknowledge the weight of who God is, we'll never understand the way to bring him glory. So what should we acknowledge about God? His wisdom has no limits, inexhaustible. Number two, his greatness has no measure. We sang it. There is no one like our God, no one higher than him. His greatness has no measure. Romans 11, 34 now and 35 says this, who knows enough to give God advice and who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? Is that not awesome and challenging? Like Paul actually, when he wrote this, is a direct quote. He was directly quoting the Greek translation of Isaiah 40, verses 13 through 15. It says this, Who is able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No. For all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. Whoa! Like on and on and on, the scriptures talk about the greatness, the majesty, the grandeur, the absolute wonder and power of who God is. His wisdom has no limits. His greatness has no measure. Yet, 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 don't we so easily find the audacity to question God? I'll change it to I. Don't I so easily find the audacity to try and give God advice. I, I, I try and, and tell, tell God how I think he should run the cosmos. The very cosmos that he created, by the way, with the breath of his mouth. Or, or, I'll use I again. I believe that God somehow owes me something that I deserve an answer from the God whose greatness has no measure. Listen, God's not afraid of our questions, okay? Please don't hear me saying that we can never ask God questions. All I'm saying is, if we question God, we shouldn't expect to get any answers. 
Because who knows enough to give God advice? Who's ever given him so much that he needs to pay it back? Listen, I don't deserve anything from God, including answers to my questions. I don't deserve anything. And by the way, there is a big difference between questioning God and criticizing his character. Okay, there's a difference. As I said, God's not afraid of our questions, but because of his greatness, we better approach God with praise and awe, not pride and arrogance. Because his greatness has no measure. In the book of Job, God allowed Job to lose everything. He did not cause it, he allowed it. He lost his health, his wealth, every one of his kids. He lost everything. His life was an absolute mess. And as you can imagine, Job wanted answers. In fact, Job demanded some answers from God. And look what God says in response to Job's demands. Job 38, 1 through 3. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. What? What? Like, that's where you tell God, hold on a second, I need to go change my underwear. <laughs> like, for real. Brace yourself like a man, God said. You have questions? How about you answer some questions for me? Now, these won't be on the screen. If you want to read them all, I'm, I'm only choosing a few. Chapters 38 and 39 of Job are God's questions back to Job, and they are unanswerable questions. So here's a few. They're not on the screen, but here's a few of the questions God had for Job and he just wanted to know, can you answer these? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear or caused the sun to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you visited the storehouses of snow? And do you know where I keep the hail? Which would be great to know where the hail is so you can avoid it. But God's like, do you even know where I keep that stuff? And then after the first round of questions, God says this to Job, verse 21 of 38. But of course you know all this, for you were born before it was all created, and you are so very experienced. I feel a lot better about my gift of sarcasm when I read the Bible sometimes. I am convinced it is the hidden spiritual gift. We've just not found it in the original language yet. And I have been blessed with full measure of the spiritual gift of sarcasm, and this just makes me feel better. God didn't stop there. He continued asking questions. He asked questions like, can you direct the movement of the stars? Can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike as you direct it? And then this one might be my favorite. It's like completely random. Do you know when the wild goats give birth? <laughs> have you seen the deer give birth to their young Someone's here like, I sure did, saw it on my hunting camera. <laughs> I don't know why I turned into a weird, you know, redneck when I say that, but if you have a hunting camera, I apologize. There's nothing against you. <laughs> I guess it's actually kind of comical. God's just throwing out all these questions he has no answer to. And then after, after all, all two chapters of this, Job 40 verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Job, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Then Job replied to the Lord, and this should be our response, I am nothing. I'm nothing. Your greatness knows no measure. Your wisdom has no limits. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. That's some solid advice for a lot of us right there. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. Whew. Man. God's not afraid of our questions. I'm just not sure we want him to answer them. Because of his greatness, when we have questions, we better approach God with praise and awe, not pride and arrogance. 
Until we acknowledge the weight of who God is, we'll never understand the way to bring him glory. So what should we acknowledge about God? His wisdom has no limits. His greatness has no measure. Number three, his glory knows no bounds. His glory knows no bounds. Romans eleven thirty six. kind of going back to the beginning now, says this. For, or literally, Paul saying, in light of all of that, everything comes from him. That includes you and me, by the way. For everything comes from him, and we exist by his power, and we are intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. This is the final statement of the first 11 chapters of Romans, and I believe it is the only appropriate response as human beings. All glory to him forever. Amen. I believe this one verse is the lens in which the final five chapters of Romans need to be read and applied. The first 11 chapters are, are almost all theological in nature, what we should believe. The last five chapters of Romans are almost all applicational. How should we behave? That you, you believe the right things first, and that belief then begins to change your behavior. Glory changes us. So we're talking about next week. We start diving into how, how does the glory of God change us, which, by the way, when you experience God's glory, you can't help but be changed. And I would even say, if you have not changed, you may not have experienced God's glory, because glory changes us. So this is what the rest of the series will be about. The last five chapters of Romans, the entire sermon series is in response to this one verse. Glory is something God is. His wisdom has no limits. His greatness has no measure. His glory has no bounds. So because of that, Glory then becomes something I give to God because of who he is. And glory is something that God does in me. It changes us. It unites us. We're going to see how God's glory actually makes us part of a body. We become one in Christ. And it gives me purpose that because of God's glory, I have a purpose to live on the planet. This is going to be an incredible sermon series I think we're going to be super challenged by as a church. And here's the thing. Okay? This is a free will thing. You don't have to give God glory. But God will get his glory whether you willingly give it or not. Because he is glory. It belongs to him. Jude 1, 24 and 25 says this. Now, all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord, all glory, majesty, power, and authority, they are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Drop the mic. Like God has always been glory. He currently is glory and he forever will be glory. And whether you give it or not, he receives it because that's who he is. Or, or I can choose to give God glory back and join the chorus of creation in praising and honoring our God. I actually think the greatest way we give God glory, the greatest way, is by putting our faith in the sacrificial death of his son Jesus it was the greatest sacrifice the universe will ever know. And when I put my faith in Christ, it gives God such glory. In fact, I added this verse very last minute, was reminded of it. So it's not in the notes if you're following along on version. But 2 Corinthians 4.15 says this, all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. As God's grace reaches people, God gets more glory. So grace, glory. Grace, glory. And what is grace? It is the free gift of Jesus on our behalf. That all of us have sinned. That sin separates us from God forever. But God, 
in his astounding mercy, sent Jesus to bridge the gap. And Jesus paid the price for our sins. He died and rose again and ascended into heaven. And now, by faith in that Jesus, my sins are forgiven, my life is set free, and I will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus forever. And that brings God glory. So maybe there's someone here today. You've never given God glory by putting your faith in him for the forgiveness of your sins. If that's you, I'd love to lead you in a prayer of putting your faith in Jesus. If you say this prayer with me silently in your heart to God, Father in heaven, I believe in Jesus. I want that grace, that gift of salvation. So Jesus, I put my faith in you, that you died in my place, you rose from the dead, and you will return again one day. And I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean, make me new. I repent of the way I have lived. I'm going to turn from my old life and follow you in my new life. Give me power to live for you every day. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. Please live in my heart, and I will do my best to love you back. It's in your name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer to put your faith in Jesus you're among family. I have prayed that prayer in my own life. Many others have as well, and we are following Jesus with you. But we want to know about it. We want to celebrate. And so if you're here, if I could get all the lights on, that would be great. If you're here and you just put your faith in Jesus to forgive, for the forgiveness of your sins, would you boldly lift up your hand, leave it up, and say, yep, that's me. I just asked Jesus into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Anybody? All right. Right there. Praise God. Amen. Amen right there. Praise God. Welcome to the family. Anybody else? I want to see you. Anybody else? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Listen, listen, it's the best decision you'll ever make. It's the hardest one you'll ever live out. And so I would encourage you to pick up one of these devotionals, the 21 devotional or even the Romans one, and start working your way through the Bible. It is God's next step for you to do that, all right? We'd love to, love to know about it too. We're not gonna hound you or anything, but we'd love to just have your information, just marking your connection card that you put your faith in Christ today and just drop it off in the boxes or at guest services. Uh, the devotions are available out there as well. Let me pray for you real quick and then remain still. Got a few closing remarks. God, you're so good. Thank you for the, the new life that's been, been found today. Lord, that your, your mercy, as we sang, is astounding. We don't deserve it, but you still give it. And we thank you for that, God. Lord, may we go out from here with a greater acknowledgement of the weight of who you are, and may it help us bring glory to you in Jesus' name, amen. If you are new, please stop by the living room on your way out. If you need prayer for anything, stop by the purple tent all the way in the back, and a prayer team member will pray for you for whatever's going on in your life. I love you guys so much. We'll pick up in Romans 12, 1 and 2 next week. You are dismissed.